recording purposes. By participating in this session, you are consenting to the recording, retention, and future viewing of this meeting. This meeting is now being live streamed. Great. Good. Thank you, Tom. And uh, I, uh, re uh, repeating what Terry said, it's really nice to see everybody here in person, most everybody here, rather than a box on the computer on the screen. So it's uh, welcome. And uh, Terry, may we have a, a roll call, please? Sure. All right. Chair Becker. Here. Senator DeSanto. Here, but not connected. <laughs> <laughs> Still counts. The brain is engaged. That's I'm engaged. Okay. Chair Fillman. Chair. Right, chair. Yeah. 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 <laughs> representative Frankel. Designee until the representative appears moment. Okay. Got it. Momentarily. Okay. Good. Treasurer Garrity. Here. We're getting the voice it's recordings here. Uh, Senator Hughes. Uh, Matt Lindsay on behalf of Senator Hughes. <coughs> hey, Matt. Welcome. Thank you. Mr. Jordan. Here. Yes. Representative Schimmel. Here. Yes. Uh, Ms. Soderbergh. Here. Yes. And Mr. Thal, he said he was going to be he had a conflict, so he's not here. Mr. Thal? Nope. Secretary Vag? Here. He's online. He's online. Oh, is he going to be online? He is. So let's put I'm here. Okay. Okay. So we're going to put the sign just so everybody knows it's Secretary Vag. Okay. Very good. Okay, that completes our roll. Okay, everyone is accounted for. Uh, the uh, first order of business is the approval of the June 8, 2021 Investment Committee meeting. So moved. May I have a motion? Thank you. May I have a second, please? Second. Okay. All in favor, aye. 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 <coughs> Those, no. Hearing none, motion passed. Uh, old business, there's uh, no old business uh, this time at this meeting. Uh, so we will move directly into uh, new business, and we have no manager presentations uh, this uh, this meeting, but we have several uh, updates by the investment office. So I'm going to turn it over to Acting Chief Investment Officer Jim Nolan and the investment office team. Thanks, Mr. Becker. Uh, present with us also from the investment office today. Uh, Bill Trong, our Managing Director of Public Markets, and Jared Snyder, the Portfolio Manager, supporting Bill uh, to address any questions that may come up with the reports that were put together. Uh, in the first two presentations here that you'll find in Section 5A in Board Docs, one labeled Rebalance Update and the other Fixed Income Update. Uh, fortunately, <coughs> we haven't needed to uh, rebalance recently as cash has been coming in, uh, distributions have been coming in ahead of, ahead of schedule in our private markets program, um, but our steady flow of benefit payments have been going out, leaving the cash fairly um, at, at good levels. So we haven't needed to raise cash <clears throat> in some time. We did have a small transaction rebalancing within the small cap uh, to reduce some concentration exposure and higher fees with an active manager and rebalance that into uh, passive. So that was done and that's captured in that rebalancing presentation, but trying to keep on time here, we won't go through all the detail unless somebody has a question on that transaction. Okay, and then secondly, as you're aware, uh, the prior CIO, Seth Kelly, had spent uh, a fair amount of time educating this board on the importance of liability uh, or thinking about the liability while you're thinking about your investment decisions. And uh, we embarked on a um, modification of our fixed income structure. So that's been ongoing to minimize fees um, <clears throat> and transaction costs. We're working into that allocation over time, uh, about 18 months it will take to complete, but you'll see a recap labeled the fixed income transition update in uh, section 5A. Uh, that's 
routine. It's, it's been going on the same, just, just a measured pace. But if there's any questions on that, we have the team here to address them. Okay, no questions on that. And we welcome Callan to the room. For those of you who may, you may not met Tom Shingler and Jay Coupler, they Jay flew in from San Francisco. Um, you could have used teams, <laughs> but uh, he just couldn't bear the opportunity to uh, miss the opportunity to come into the boardroom. So, <clears throat> so thanks for coming, Callan and Jay, for making that extra trip. Okay, if there's no questions on those first two presentations, we'll move on to Section 5B in Board Docs. And there we have an asset allocation discussion. And uh, Kelly, do we have the uh, revised live stream presentation available? And if I could direct you, Tom Shingler and Jay will talk about that. But I, if I could direct you to page nine of that presentation for just a moment. <clears throat> Yes, thank you. Um, what, what this shows are three columns, obviously, but the first one was the asset allocation that this board approved at the end of 2019 when we implemented just before the uh, pandemic started in early 2020. And key, key point to make there, the fixed income allocation, uh, that was at 30%. That was up quite a bit from where it was the prior allocation from the 2018-2019 strategic investment plan. Uh, and that really helped this plan through that pandemic last year, that higher allocation to fixed income. Uh, another way to think of that fixed income allocation, prior to enacting that asset allocation back in 2019, I'd like to think about how many years of net benefit payments are covered. So if you think about our monthly outflow of about 300 million in benefit payments, about 200 million coming in in contributions from employers and employees, we have a negative cash flow of about 100 million a month at this plan. Prior to implementing that allocation back in 2019, we were covering about four years of net benefit payments, or we had the ability to cover four years of net benefit payments with break the glass, fixed income, safe investments, uh, and not have to sell any of our return-seeking assets at, a, at depressed values. After the implementation of this plan, we took that allocation up to 30%, as I mentioned, and that brought us up to about seven and a half years of net benefit payment coverage. So a substantial increase in just sleep at night type of asset allocation. Since then, Seth came on, and as I mentioned a moment ago, he educated the board on the importance of paying attention to what drives the liability. And so you can see he kept the allocation the same to fixed income, 30%. But if you look at the buckets below the fixed income total, you'll see that there were some specific subclasses that he wanted to bring to you through the education sessions more focused on generating income. So some high yield, uh, some longer duration instruments, uh, is, is that's a key driver of the liability fluctuation and so forth. So I just wanted to point that out that that was maintained uh, and that brings us up to, that, that fixed income allocation was maintained and that brings us up to today's conversation. Uh, ironically, this, this structure now with that 30% of fixed income, uh, supports in excess of nine years of net benefit payments, which I've had calls with most of you. Thank you for taking the time over the last couple of weeks. Uh, some felt that was nice, but others felt that might have been a little more than needed. Uh, could we potentially look at an allocation to uh, enhance the total return of the system to uh, get closer? Uh, you can see the current allocation supports way down at the bottom of the chart. Uh, you can see it supports a 6.05% 10-year compound return based off of Callan's capital market assumptions. So the challenge was, could we get that closer to our existing 7.0% expected rate of return from our actuaries, which you'll be discussing at Sarah's meeting immediately after this and talking about potentially modifying that. Uh, but the, the challenge was, could we get a higher return 
potentially to discuss here today and there was an overwhelming yes from all of you so we went ahead and worked with our friends at Callen and developed this allocation and once again I got to go right back to fixed income I was talking about that 30 percent supporting now nine years of net benefit payments uh, by adjusting that downwards by four percent uh, four or five that number's pretty small uh, we, we still we're still able to maintain that seven plus years of net benefit payment sort of think about it as insurance or protection in case of a downturn um, you wouldn't have to sell a return seeking asset for upwards of seven years that's pretty nice um, so Terry saw that allocation and thought that that made sense and most of you that I've talked to also thought this at least warrants consideration so Callen's going to talk to you today about uh, how they develop these uh, capital market assumptions and then go into a little bit more detail uh, on how we were able to achieve a little bit higher return not taking on excessive risk but still being mindful of that very important metric of ensuring that we can meet all benefit payments for an extended period of time uh, regardless of what happens in the economy are there, are there any questions at this point if not we can turn it over to uh, Tom Shingler and Jay Kopler. Do you want to back on page one, Tom? I, I had us down to page nine. Is there a three? Uh, sure. three. Let's yeah. start. We can start. Uh, this, uh, first of all, good morning, everybody. It's nice to see you all in person. I've good morning. watched you through a little tiny screen <laughs> over the last year. Is this on now? It is. I'm sorry. Thank you. Uh, Tom and I will probably tag team this, mm -hmm. if that's okay. If you go to slide one, I'm not going to go through this in detail. We already spoke to this um, in April, right? Um, there's, a, there's a big eye chart here, but this is the backdrop, so you know what we're talking about. I think it's actually more important if you move to slide three, please. Slide three, we'll discuss what did we do and why. So after going through last year's um, incredible capital market experience where the stock market went down 33.5% and then went up 70, um, we had a richly valued equity market. Bonds also had an incredible year last year when interest rates were cut to zero. So as we started this year looking forward, our thought was we've kind of taken the next three years good returns all in one year. And we're going to have to reset the capital markets based on what's happening in fixed income. You're back to a zero interest rate policy, which we believe would be held in place to about 2023. So as a result, we lowered our cash return to 1%. It's, you know, it's a negative real return when you compare it to inflation. We lowered our core fixed income return by, by 1% down to 175. It's actually negative relative to inflation as well because we have a 2% inflation assumption. Um, and we pulled down our equity returns by between 45 and 55 basis points, depending on whether it was U.S., non-U.S., large and small, emerging, developed. So right now, you're just doing a rule of thumb. If you're at 70-30, you know, that's 70% of your returns coming down by 50 basis points and 30% of your returns coming down by 100 basis points, looking forward. I mean, remember, you had an incredible couple of years, both 19 and 20, you had double-digit returns on the fund. Um, it's not pleasant news to deliver, but it, we think it's reasonable and rational. You have to start with where current yields are on the fixed income market. Interest rates will rise going forward. We do believe it, and the Fed has indicated that, but it's a couple years away. What happens when rates rise? What happens to your fixed income portfolio? You lose money. It's already showing up this year. You're down, you know, the, the broad market's down about 75 basis points. Um, the equity market is roaring. Valuations are at levels we don't typically see. We actually built in a bit of a ratcheting back of valuation in our capital market expectations. So that's sort of the sobering news. Um, it's <laughs> Tom and I have been going around to talk to clients and saying, you know, congratulations, you just had probably some of the best capital market results you're going to see. And going forward, they're not going to look like that. And that's the challenge. So that's the, the broad picture there. If you turn to the next slide, please, which is slide four. Yes, absolutely. I, I'm sorry, I thought it was on. Um, so just go over why you think the next three years are not going to be strong with the public markets. Uh, we're looking out 10 years. 
Mm -hmm. So the next two or three years could be very strong. Fixed income is not going to look good. Mm -hmm. um, rates have already risen on their own without the Fed making any move this year. You've seen that loss in the capital markets. Then the Fed is going to move in and start raising, you know, the federal funds rate that they mar follow. The markets always anticipate what they do. So fixed income is already on a path to having a couple of years of negative return, okay, just in the next three years. For equity results, there's no reason why it can't run hot for the next two years. I, I'm totally in agreement there. But over the 10-year period, um, there's going to have to be a, a rationalization of valuation. I mean, it's just, it's we're at levels that we haven't seen, even back to the global the, or the uh, the dot com bubble. Mm -hmm. And you know, how, how does the market adjust? Well, it brings prices back in line with underlying fundamentals. And so, um, you, know, you you can build up an equity return based on, okay, what are your expectations for GDP growth? That can drive assumptions for earnings. Earnings are really important for the stock market. You could add to that an assumption for inflation. You can add to that an assumption for the return on free cash flow. Mm -hmm. That sounds exotic. Think of it as dividends for the most part, right? right? And then you can add to that, what do you think is going to happen to valuation? All right? So GDP growth expectations for the next 10 years, not the next year or two, but the next 10 years, we're at two to two and a half. Then you add another 2% for inflation on that, you're at four and a half or five, roughly speaking. Mm -hmm. You can add a dividend yield of about seven or about two, excuse me, you get up to seven. But then we think the markets are richly valued and we've taken 50 basis points off compounding every year for the next 10 years. So now you're at six and a half. Mm -hmm. And as conservative as that sounds, we are the most optimistic forecasters out there. All right. All right. I understand what you're saying. I don't necessarily agree with it, but mm -hmm. that's not for this discussion, I guess. <laughs> sure. Sure. And, and if it, it gives you any comfort, uh, one of the things we do do when we do our forecast is what are other people looking at and forecasting? We do it after the fact. We don't try to tune ours to theirs. And um, <clears throat> if you look across people who forecast for a living, like us, people who manage money and do forecasts, they have a different perspective, and people who sell forecasts, who don't have a stake in what the outcome is. Um, for equity results, we're probably a little more sanguine than most. For fixed income, we're in line with everybody. For inflation, even though you see what's going on in the market with a lot of concern on the headline level, 10-year forecasts for inflation are still pretty low, somewhere around two. Um, we're not really an outlier. Um, and, and I'm not saying the safety in the herd, but we're also aware of what others are doing. Okay. Jay, one question. Um, we're looking out 10 years. Yes. When will we look at, when will we do that again? Next year. We'll do, we do it every, every year. We'll, we'll change these projections. Yeah, and we try not to change them a lot. I mean, these are our projections, this chart here, over the last uh, 30 years. And the challenge is when you've been around as long as we have, You've been around long, to, long enough to see how good your forecast is, right? And individually, each asset class, the forecast, you know, will miss some 10-year periods. But as a, a cumulative group of, you know, what does a portfolio look like? I've been very surprised at how good they've been. You know, we'll be doing 50 to 100 basis points on a 10-year basis for a projection. Yeah, good. good, thank you. Mm -hmm. Other questions on this before I move on? OK. Um, if we move to slide six, it'll be one more big picture thing that we'll discuss here. Um, this is a, a thought exercise we go through every year, and it started with a question asked by one of our fund sponsor clients like yourself a couple of years ago, which is, look at the rightmost chart. What do I need to do to get to 7%? And given our expectations now, you need to have a portfolio that's almost all growth. It's a pretty challenging picture, given what I just described. So 3% in fixed income, everything else in, is in growth assets. What if you had asked me that question 15 years ago? You have projections from 15 years ago, don't you? We do. You get a, fork, a portfolio that's two-thirds fixed income. I still get the 7%. Remember, yields 15 years ago were substantially higher than where we are now. What about 1991? Well, <laughs> return on the yield on cash was about 6.8 in 1991. So you could get the 7 without a problem. Now, was that what people were shooting for? If you go to the next slide, look at real returns. What if you're trying to get the 5% real? Well, back in 1991, you would have needed 
half in fixed income and half in growth assets. Because inflation was a lot higher. So to get to that real return. But you'll look all the, again, all the way out. The way to read this is over the last 30 years, and this has been your experience as well, to get to a desired return, you've had to take on more and more equity risk and have less and less protection for fixed income. And that's been one of the challenges facing pretty much all of our investors. And so the question when we first started working with you a couple years ago was, can you, do you really want something with 3% in fixed income? You'll have no protection in a down market. And that's how, as Jim was describing, how you ended up with adopting a different portfolio with perhaps a little more, um, a little more protection on the downside, moving to 30% in fixed income. And then there's been annual adjustments along the way. So to move to the punchline, uh, back to the chart that Jim started with on page nine, um, again, the prior target allocation was really only a couple of years old. This was after we did a full asset liability study for you <clears throat> and the adjustment to a 30% in fixed income. And then as, um, as Jim described, um, the input from Seth over the last year led to the adjustment to the fixed income exposure. But if you look above the fixed income line, there was really just modest adjustments made. So private equity was brought down from 14 to 12, um, and then some other adjustments were made. Uh, covered calls were added as a potential asset class funded from large cap. Okay. I don't know, Tom, do you have any other comments on that part? Yeah, I would say from the perspective, if you look at the prior target and where we were, that was the target that we modeled last summer because you're looking at this every year. Right, and expectations have come down across the board. So what we would have modeled last year versus this year, it's gonna look lower um, across the board. And then we've got these incremental differences in equity and, and fixed income and illiquid exposure. I think what's key to keep in mind here is if you look at the prior target versus the current target, that <clears throat> there has been a shift to a little bit more liquidity and equity. So if you look at what's happened with private equity, you approved a new target that reduced that from 14 to 12. And real estate was kept the same at eight and private credit at four. So the overall illiquid exposure did go down a little bit. And that was replaced with public equity exposure. Uh, Jay mentioned the covered calls, but there's also the introduction of, of micro cap, which we're in a search for to hire micro cap managers. So, if you think about that, it's still keeping the, broadly speaking, the same level of equity exposure, but giving you a more liquid version of it. Whereas if you compare that, that target in the middle in the blue to the alternative target that we've got on the right, what's the difference there? There's some key points. One is that we're taking down the private markets even more. So real estate going from eight to seven. So you get, if you look back to the target uh, last year, you had 26% in the liquids. This would bring it to 23. It does increase the public equity exposure. So this is taking public equity from 44% of the portfolio up to 50, and it's reducing the fixed income exposure by 5%. So what, is that, what does that mean in totality? It means that this, this alternative asset allocation that you could potentially adopt, it's not a sea change, it's an incremental change from where you are today, but it is incrementally increasing the risk and return of the portfolio. So if we look at it from a range of return perspective, not focusing on just this 6.05 versus 6.22 10 year compound return, if you look at a range of returns, broadly speaking, what you'd expect is whether you kept the seven target or you moved it down a little bit, your probability of hitting that target goes up a little bit. That's what you can expect, but there's trade-offs, right? So for instance, we look at this in, in our deck in later slides, in a worst case scenario, so we're defining that as a 95th percentile worst case type scenario, you're gonna lose more. So it's, there's, not, there's not a free lunch to it. Uh, your probability of loss, so having a negative return in any given year, is higher. So th that's, from a decision-making perspective, if I'm a board member, that's really what uh, we think you need to focus on is, is those trade-offs, that your comfort level with taking a little bit more risk, and again, it's not a sea change, 
but taking a little bit more risk in the portfolio uh, to try and get closer to hitting a, 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 an assumed rate, whether it's seven or slightly lower than seven, versus what happens in the worst case scenarios and living through those, uh, those, those potentially uh, really negative years from a return perspective. The, so I've got a question yeah, for sure. you, just on a high level. Yep. So do you not like real estate now, or are you just lowering that to make your numbers work to the new recommended rate? For the real estate from eight to seven? Yes. So the the real estate from eight to seven, that's that's a one percentage point change driven by a couple things from our perspective is saying, okay, we still want to have equity or equity-like risk in the portfolio because you need that. Mm -hmm. uh, whether you pick an assumed rate of seven or one that's slightly lower, you certainly need a lot of that. But if you get move away from real estate, one aspect of that is that uh, it's a nod to the reality of where the portfolio is. So that's closer to your actual, where you actually are in assets in the ground, uh, seven versus eight. The other aspect of it from our perspective is that if we look at it in terms of putting new money in the ground, uh, the team there, you you don't have the team right now, right? In terms of the, the horses, the people that ran that team are no longer at service. So do you, how are you going to de deploy that capital? So when we think about it pragmatically, you tick it down to where the, where the portfolio is today and say you keep it steady state for now and assuming you're going to look at it again in a year. Yeah. So, I mean... <laughs> You're saying we're not looking at real estate because we don't have the personnel and SIRS to look at it? Is, is that what you said? Well, yeah. In, in one, of the, one other thing yeah. to put in there, uh, this board has, as I've had calls over this round uh, of calls that I had with you recently, as well as the, back in 2019, um, there, there's a common thread for lower fees and higher liquidity, and real estate is neither of those. Mm -hmm. Furthermore, uh, we just haven't been able to deliver with real estate. If you look at our historical one, three, five, even 10 years. Mm -hmm. And again, it's, it's underperforming for us this year. Furthermore, uh, the uncertainty has probably never been higher in real estate. There will be some opportunities as we're coming into the, you know, All right, we can world. talk offline. I don't yeah. want to take up time. Thank you. Yeah. Sure. And if I can offer up some final commentary as we looked at this, you know, the, the big question is, why would you offer up this alternative asset class mix, given that you just adopted a new one and you just adopted one, you know, made a modest change from when you adopted two years ago? Part of it is a recognition of the reality that returns are going to be modest going forward. And this is a conversation we've had with every single investor that we work with. Uh, you know, you move to a less risky position on purpose. It's to suit your, per suit your needs and to suit your tolerance for risk is moving from 30 back to 25 a capitulation? We don't think so. And it's an acknowledgement of reality of where expectations are going to be for the fixed income uh, portfolio. We, as Tom has said a number of times, we don't think it's a, it's more of an evolution and we think it's reasonable and you're not alone in making these considerations. Part of it too is that you've added in that period um, or built up this private credit component to your portfolio, which has some fixed income like exposure, but it's not going to give you the protection in a down market. But it's also not equity. <clears throat> yeah, I think it's important from our perspective, when we look back to when we first came bo on board in 2019, and what we recommended it was an extremely risky portfolio, very high in the liquids, very little fixed income, the allocation was very low and within fixed income, uh, it was very aggressive. Not much of it was core. So part of this is, and, and we looked at all kinds of metrics related to liquidity and downside protection where you have to live through the down markets. It's easy to get complacent today because returns have been so strong. We had a, a two month bear market last year, but in general, we've been in a really strong period for, for equity returns in the US in particular. So building a, a portfolio that is more all weather we made recommendations back in 2019. We can't come here two years later and say, change everything uh, because valuations are high, because yields are low, that you should take all this risk to try and get a better chance to get to seven. That would not be responsible on our part. It wouldn't be prudent. And we're not doing that. We are saying you could take this other course. Uh, it's, it's 
a little bit riskier, but it's it's risk that we think is still uh, it's still reasonable. The portfolio, so looking at the mix between equity-like risk and fixed income, looking within fixed income, not all fixed income is the same. You can't sell high yield in a down market to pay benefits. Uh, you're going to have to look to other parts of your portfolio, like cash, treasuries, potentially tips. So we're thinking about all those elements of the portfolio, and we think this is reasonable. We can go through more data to show you, uh, try and illustrate better what you're trading off if you're pick, picking between the two. But I think that's really important for the board to understand is that we're not going to come to you with anything that we think is uh, is out of bounds simply to, to try and meet an assumed rate. That wouldn't be uh, prudent advice on our part. So we're... We're doing something that we think is is reasonable as an option away from where you are, which you could stay with where you are too. Tom, um, um, one thing we should keep in mind when we, if we should we move um, the uh, increase the equity exposure, the uh, public equity exposure, particularly on the large cap side, that would be moving into passive instruments. I would I would think primarily, uh, as opposed to actively managed funds, so it would not have a huge impact on on fees at that point. No, and if you look at, we didn't. Uh, I know Sir Staff has has looked at this, but we didn't we didn't put it in here. But if you look at this allocation, it is the alternative target. You're taking down your illiquids, you're you're reducing your fees, you're reducing your complexity in terms of implementation. Does that answer what you're? Yeah, I've done. yeah. From a historical perspective, to follow up with Tom, you know, prior to the implementation of the 2019 asset allocation, our our target exposure to illiquid assets was approximately 35 percent. Mm -hmm. We took that down to approximately 25 percent, and now we're taking it down a little bit further to 22 percent. You know, we are very fee conscious, and we have to strike a balance between private equity, private credit, and real estate. Uh, you know, to come up with this alternative asset allocation from a fee balance perspective. Just, just to memorialize that a little bit, uh, Chairman Becker, the fee estimate on the current allocation with our internal model that Tom just referenced uh, is about 50 basis points, which is down from the mid 60s five years ago, which is good. We want to maintain that. And if we go forward with this new allocation, it drops by another. One basis point to we estimate about forty nine basis points. So we're still heading in the right direction. Mm -hmm. <clears throat> um, if I can have you turn to slide uh, eleven, and I'll explain this, and then there's a couple of slides that follow that follow the same format, so it'll be easy to understand. Um, we, what we just showed you was a point estimate, or the midpoint of a range, and you're just like, oh my god, six oh five, we're not going to get what we need. Well, that's the midpoint of a range of simulated outcomes. So what, is that, what does that range actually look like? And so if you look at the top chart, what we've done is show you the simulation results for one year, five years, and 10 years. This is just return. <laughs> we put the 7% target in there. And then those little numbers next to the bar charts give you our projected probability of a getting 7% in any one-year period, any five-year period, any 10-year period. So it's not zero. It's not a one-zero proposition. M midpoint of the range is 50th percentile, right? So 47 is pretty close to 50. So in any given year, you can get to seven, but there's a pretty wide range of results. You can see as high as 30 and as low as uh, minus 14. If you look at the alternative target, <clears throat> which is you know a little bit more in equity, um, the expected case result, the median is a little bit higher. The probability of getting there is a little bit higher. The range of results is a little bit wider. That's the result of taking a little bit more risk. If you move all the way out to 10 years, so you can see the probability goes from a 41, you know, projected 41% chance to projected 43. So it's modestly higher expected result in the expected case. And so that's, and we like this way of looking at the world because it kind of gives you a flavor of, okay, well, it's, it's not, oh, I'm, I'm not going to ever get anywhere near my 7%. Well, that's not true. Okay. There's a range of potential outcomes. Yes. Just so I'm clear. So on the top on current target, 6.05 expected return. So you're saying you have a 47% chance of getting 6.05. No, of getting 7%. Okay. 
getting the 7%, 47% uh, uh, or 47 percent of the observations will actually be 7% or above. Okay. In one year. In one year. Yeah. And then c the others are compounding over 5 and 10. Yeah. Well, yeah. I got that. Five and 10. <laughs> yeah. All right. Thank you. Mm-hmm. And then the following charts, what we looked at, because this is a you know, topic for discussion with Sarah's meeting coming up, is what if you lowered the discount rate and, the, and you have the same portfolio, what is the chance that you would achieve that? So we looked at what if you dropped it by 12 uh, or 0.125 basis point? <laughs> yes, well, 125 basis points. There we go. 12.5 um, basis points. There we go. If you go to slide 12, please. Uh, so it has a projected return of six eight seven five. Sounds very precise, and you can see that you know the probabilities you know nudge up a little bit, uh, and over ten years, um, you know the alternative target you're now forty four percent chance. You're getting closer to a median result. The next chart is what if you lowered your discount rate or your assumed return by twenty five basis points, <clears throat> and again you're getting closer to the oh sorry slide thirteen yes. So we can look at this in you know, a variety of different ways, but we're just trying to get, you know, inform you as to it's not a zero one probability. Here's the range of potential results as you're considering new discount rates. You know, what's what's the chance these uh, are expected returns line up with the, your projected or your expected results as you're considering a discount rate? The final thing to look at um, is probability of loss because this matters. I mean, you ask uh, a non-investment professional, what is, what's risk? It's the chance of loss. When we look at portfolios, risk is the variability of return, which includes good and bad. But what's the probability of loss? So the way we've tried to look at this here is we've got the range of pro uh, projected results. You know, look at the, the, the loss I would think of as you know, the line across the bottom, so a 95th percentile result. So if you take the current target, you look out over one, two, three, five, and 10 years, the range gets narrower over time, but you know, a worst case result, a one in 20 chance is essentially zero or a little bit negative. That would be terrible over a 10 year period. That's a pretty terrible outcome. Um, and it gets a little bit worse um, if you take on more risk, but the expected case result is a little better. Um, probably a better way to summarize it, sorry? No, it's, it's, yeah. If you go to page 16, we've tried to summarize this in a little bit easier format. And we put dollar values next to it. So. The, the, the market value of the fund at March 31st is $35.3 billion. Um, if we apply that worst case outcome over one year, minus 14% return, you lose $5 billion, you could be down to, to $30 billion. If you take the alternative target, it's a tiny bit more of a worst case re outcome. So again, it puts actual dollars next to it. It can be quite scary when you look at it that way. But you know, we've seen these results before in our investment lifetime. So to summarize, um, I guess the, the, the point here that, that's in front of you is, go back to slide nine, please. Um, you know, looking at our capital market expectations, you have a current target allocation you just put in place. Our expected result for that is six and a half, six point oh five percent return on a compound basis over the next ten years. As we explored the notion of, well, is would there be any recommended change one could consider? And you could take five percent out of fixed income, take one percent out of real estate, put those in the public equity market, and you'd be taking a little bit more risk for the potential outcome of a little bit better return. So, Jim, I don't know if you have any. Any uh, further questions, discussion? Go to a motion, then. Uh, essentially, what we're deciding is to stay where we are or to move to this alternative. That's right. Uh, that's displayed on page nine. Here. Yes. That's the decision. Yes. Uh, any strong reactions either way? And just to be clear, the investment policy statement uh, is in board docs for your convenience with the adjustments to the various asset classes that Jay and Tom just went through. So uh, you'd be voting on adopting the changes that have been provided to you in that allocation uh, or that IPS investment policy statement to get to the alternative allocation you see here, just, just to be crystal clear. 
So this is um, a recommendation to the board. The board will vote on this, and we'll have <coughs> some discussion potentially around this in executive session. Because there's been no discussion at all, I mean, from their perspective, but, you know, just how this affects contribution rates and, you know, with employees and, you know, how this affects our deal with PSERS, I mean, not PASHI and Penn right. State and all that stuff. I mean, Senator, the next meeting, the uh, <coughs> Sears meeting, the finance member services meeting, right. Corn Ferry is going to be in there talking to you specifically about that. And they have a sensitivity okay. table showing both uh, – the percent of payroll that will be affected by making this shift, okay, and also the funded status per uh, Secretary Bag's request. Both those tables are present in there, okay. and you'll be talking about that at length there. We just wanted you to know before you go into that meeting, right. and you're presented with these three options: maintaining the seven, dropping the six and seven eighths, or six and three quarters. That there is an alternative allocation to close that gap a little bit, right. and it can be done with reasonable risk taking as uh, Callan just went right. through. Yeah. Yeah, Senator, I think the, the impact on funding status and contribution, employer contributions, I think that's tied into the, the assumption rate, mm -hmm. not not the asset allocation necessarily right. of what we're doing. So, so, part of the conversation. Yeah, mm -hmm. sure. Yeah. Yeah. Right. Glenn? Sure. Um, and just to be clear, um, certainly there will be discussion as there always is healthy discussion at the board, but it would would, would not warrant uh, executive session discussion on this particular matter. Unless something else came up that was, you know, more than what we uh, have on the table now. Yeah, and the way to think about this is when you're asked to vote on that recommendation that uh, Corn Ferry is going to be presenting, or, or the alternatives, they're not going to recommend, they're going to offer alternatives. The way to think about this is the current allocation, uh, whether you choose seven, six, and seven eighths, or six and three quarters, as Jay just outlined, uh, you have a probability of hitting that one of those three returns uh, with the 605. They're, they're going to tell you that, Corn Ferry. They, 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 it will work. But you have a better chance of hitting it, or maybe more often hitting it, uh, with a somewhat higher rate of return. And that's what we've presented here as the alternative. So if this committee decides to go forward with that, it probably will be a, a more uh, uh, succinct conversation at the next committee meeting if that decision is made in this room of which allocation you want to go with, one that's a little bit higher probability, a little bit more risk, a little bit higher return, or stay with the current. So I think that's what Glenn's getting to if we want to. And just a, um, a, a one final comment from me is over the past few years, uh, what we've heard from the board is they like staff to come to the table with alternatives. Um, what, what, are, what can we consider? So that's exactly what uh, Jim is doing here today. Um, we had a discussion, and so it's really just a matter of, you know, there are other ways to do things, and we, uh, you know, take that duty um, seriously and just wanted to present an alternative for the board to consider now or in the future. Good. Okay. Any anyone else? Then okay, we have a, a motion. Then let me allow me to read the motion. And um, a motion in is, is in order to recommend that the State Employees Retirement Board adopt the alternative target asset allocation policy and corresponding updates to the SERS defined benefit plans investment policy statement. The revised sections are in the attached meeting material entitled DB Plan IPS Update. 72821 PDF. Okay. Any further discussion? Okay. May I have a motion, please? So moved. Okay. Thank you. Uh, we have a motion. May I have a second, please? Second. Second. Okay. Uh, we have a motion and a second. And any further discussion before going to vote? If not, uh, Jim, could we have the roll call, please? Yes. Okay. Chair Becker? Uh, yes. Okay, Senator DeSanto. No. Uh, Representative Frankel. Yes. Uh, Treasurer Garrity. Yes. Uh, Senator Hughes or Dan Ackel on behalf of Senator Hughes. Uh, Matt, Matt Lindsay. Oh, Matt. I'm sorry. Yes. I'm, my bad. Okay, Matt. I'm not used to you, Matt. Okay. Mm -hmm. That's a yes. yes. Um, Mr. Jordan. Yes. 
Representative Schimmel? Yes. Um, Ms. Soderberg? Yes. And Mr. Fowle, did he happen to join? No. Nope. Um, Secretary Vague? Yes. Thank you. Jim, I'd Chair like Feldman. to uh, vote if I could. Oh, did I miss? Awesome. Yes, you did. Oh, here you are. Yes. <laughs> Chair Feldman. Aye. <laughs> You moved it, so I guess I... I know I haven't been here for a while, but... Uh. <laughs> Sorry about that. Okay, we have uh, all yeas, one no, and one absent. That's it. Good. Thank you. Okay, motion carried. Thank you. Jim? Okay. Thank you for your attention to that, and again, Callum, for putting together that on sort of short notice and making the trip. Uh, appreciate it. Uh, okay, so that's that's the majority of the heavy lifting for this meeting, and now we're going to go into some, call it housekeeping, uh, where we have a, a series of meetings coming uh, in front of us on these next couple of topics. So Jeff Meyer, our Managing Director of Operations, is joining us uh, from the great city of Pittsburgh, and uh, he was able to come in in person today, so thanks for making the trip, Jeff. Uh, He's going to be covering the next two topics, the first being uh, Funstim was uh, retained. Chris Houston and uh, company had uh, conducted an uh, update for the fiduciary process that we have, and we did a, a RFP, and uh, Funstim was selected to do that, and they went through uh, over a period of a couple of months, I believe, by the time they talked to all of us and collected the information and put recommendations together, which you've all heard about. And then at the last board meeting, um, they were delegated to the various committees. And then uh, Jeff and his team have been working on all the Funston recommendations that are uh, going to be covered by the investment office. Uh, just at a high level, the documents out there with all the target dates that Jeff has committed to. And we're going to hold you to them, Jeff. And uh, one one of the particular recommendations, so, uh, had some terminology enhancement opportunity, so to speak. And we're going to come to you with a motion on that at uh, the uh, end of this conversation. But, uh, Jeff, with that, if you want to take it away. Um, we're in Section right. uh, 5C right. of Board Docs. Thank you, Jim. As, as, as Jim mentioned, my name is Jeff Meyer. I'm the Managing Director of Investment Operations at SERS. And if I could direct your attention to item 5C on today's agenda. Earlier this year, Funds and Advisory Services issued its report that included a number of recommendations that were directed to this investment committee and in turn to the investment office. A summary of those recommendations, as well as the anticipated dates of completion can be found in the Funston 2021 Recommendations Work Plan Memo on Board Docs. The Investment Office's plan to address the Funston recommendations is very similar to that of the PPMARC recommendations. Namely, we're going to provide updates to the Investment Committee as recommendations are, are implemented and or alternative action is taken, or in some cases, if no action is needed at all. For this morning's meeting, I'd like to briefly discuss Recommendation A1 that states in part that recommends the elimination of the, the, the adjective non-economic to describe SERS, in-state managers, minority and women-owned businesses, etc. My investment colleagues went through the investment officers' policies and documents, and were unable to locate this terminology in any of those documents. Thanks to Chris Houston, Chris informed us that the terminology can be found in the fiduciary review policy. Now, some of you may be wondering what impact this recommendation will have on SERS and emerging managing program. Removing the term non-economic will have no effect on that program. None whatsoever. Since the policy falls under the purview of the Board Governance and Personnel Committee, the Investment Office is recommending that the Board Governance and Personnel Committee consider amending the policy to remove the term non-economic from the policy. 
I'll be, answer, be happy to try to answer any questions you might have as it relates to this matter. Yes, sir. So if, if consideration of inst you know, someone as a manager because they happen to live in Pennsylvania or be a woman or a minority from a minority community is not non-economic, what is it? Uh, how, how do we differentiate when the board is making determinations um, on factor? We have a fiduciary responsibility to make sure that we maximize the income uh, for the you know, for the benefit of both pensioners and uh, and taxpayers. So, if we're making determinations on basis of things that are not impacting that objective, uh, how do we differentiate when we select someone because they happen to live in Pennsylvania? Representative Schemmel, that's a great question. And my understanding is that with all else being equal, we're going to give the nod to the in-state manager or the minority or women-owned uh, businesses. All right. My, my colleague, Bill Trong, and his team are in the process right now of, of reviewing additional managers that will fit the bill and provide SERS with the, the required risk-adjusted return. That that, that that this this that our, that our fiduciary responsibility calls for, and in, in uh, providing the benefits to our our participants and their their uh, beneficiaries, I hope that answers your question. Robert Shemmel, yeah. if, if, if I may, so in our source code, there is a section in the code that's been in there. I don't know how long Joe may remember, but forever um, that. The board may, when possible, and this is also in our investment policy statement, when possible, you know, we consider our PA investments or investments that will benefit the Commonwealth of Pennsylvania, um, all things being equal, that we meet our fiduciary duty, that we evaluate, um, you know, the people, the process, uh, the philosophy, strategy, opportunity set, scale, everything there is involved, but all things being equal, um, there is a section in the code for specific that we should um, consider uh, PA types of investments. Now, the board several years ago had an interest in emerging managers, which um, we rolled into the investment policy statement. And again, it's a very similar uh, analysis where all things being equal, you know, after we meet our fiduciary responsibilities, that we would favor uh, uh, minority women business enterprises, um, but you know, so far we have two in in, in the emerging manager program with total assets of power, I think five hundred and fifty million dollars, uh, actively managed because it's international small cap and emerging markets. We are looking at other strategies based off of our asset allocation with U.S. microcap. And there are some opportunities where all things, you know, being equal with our analysis with Callan, and there are some managers that are PA based, and they're 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 um they're great. Um, yeah, I, 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 I certainly understand that. I'm just wondering if we don't. I mean, that's a non-economic. That's a non-economic determination. So why don't we refer to it as a non-economic determination? <laughs> I mean, we're saying that all things being equal between A and B, we're going to always select B because B is whatever. B fits into this category that currently the board you know, believes should be favored. But isn't that a non-economic determination? Like we're saying, okay, two economic equals, we're going to choose B every time because of this policy. That's fine. I just isn't that a non-economic determination though? And I and I agree with you that there's definitely economic and non-economic. But I think I think the recommendation from Funson's perspective is don't label the the, the in-state managers, the women and minority-owned, as strictly non-economic. It's not strictly economic because we're looking at the economics. Absolutely. Perhaps perception. Not well, thank you. Thank you. Perception. Bye -bye. So, do we have any other determinations that we make as a board where we have two equal? options um, and we and we always choose you know we have a formula where we always choose one of those based on criteria uh, otherwise I'm not necessarily objecting I, I'm honestly just trying to understand I mean we need yeah, to know I, if we're gonna I, have I know, we're yeah. gonna have policy set on a formula you know we, we sort of need to know 
who's fitting into that so we know if we're meeting those objectives or, or whatever they might be. And if, if we're not labeling them this way, then, you know, then how do we know that we're meeting those objectives? And, and how do we know between, you know, if, if we look back through uh, uh, minutes of previous meetings, was the board, when the board has made determinations, why they've made the determinations certain ways? Is there another way that we know that? T Terry. Glenn, um, I noticed in the Funston report, they know under this particular recommendation in the detailed part of the report, they do state that SERS has identified economic reasons for the emerging manager program. Now, I can't tell you what they are, but <laughs> um, that yeah, so, yeah. so the reason for the emerging manager program is in fact economic. So labeling that as a non-economic thing didn't make sense to them, and that's why they made their recommendation. And sisters identified economic reasons for the emerging manager program. Just offering that up for some detail. It's in the report. Anything? Can you, are there are there any other questions? I have a question, if I may. Yes, Treasurer. Um, do you consider veteran in that category as well, veteran-owned? For the Emerging Manager Program, veteran-owned, I don't believe is part of the Emerging Manager Program as defined currently. Okay. But that is part of our process. We, we consider all these factors, especially in hiring personnel in, in the office. That's definitely. I think as it stands now, it's not incorporated in it, but it's certainly, certainly something that can be incorporated in it. Absolutely. Assuming, you know, there's economic reasons and then you get to the non-economic reasons, what's the order of decision making there? Um, it, my question is, if you are in state or out of state, does in state, is that the first decision and then you get down to women or minority or? Um, no, we, we engage um, with the uh, investment consultant first and then we take a broad swath of opportunities in, in the area, fixed income, equities, whatever we're looking at, and come up with uh, criteria to narrow that list down from mm -hmm. hundreds of managers right. to 10 or so with returns, risk, fees, and all those types of things. Is there, when you rate these, is there a number that you go down through? I, I, my, my question is simply, um, are we valuing in-state managers, uh, is that a higher decision parameter than the uh, Assuming economically the same, you know, to try to drive business to Pennsylvania. No, the the search process starts with the economic decisions. Right, I get that. And, that, and then if let's it, say the economics are all the same, correct? Okay, and you have two decision. The first the decision here is in state or out of state. That's what I'm trying to understand. Would the out of state go away right away? No, the, the analysis would, would get deeper and try to take uh, a list of hundreds to maybe 10 or 12, and then it would be narrowed down further because of calls that we do, diligence calls, and mm -hmm. uh, personnel, turnover, breadth of team, all these things, and the list keeps narrowing down. Then when we get it right. down to a subset that any of these managers appear to be good, in fact, we might even hire a couple of them, right. especially if they have uncorrelated uh, excess return generation capability, mm -hmm. it's diversification. Right. Then if uh, one of them happens to be in one of these categories, or two of them or whatever, uh, we would prefer them over another that didn't have those attributes. But it's, it's all driven by the fiduciary standards first. Right. Very clear on that. Bill, anything else I missed? That's absolutely correct. Everything is driven by the, our, you know, our analysis and the sure. economic component first and then all things being equal, that the board has expressed their interest in PA-based investments and w minority woman business own in the em emerging manager program. That's, that's in the policies um, that was adopted um, several years ago. Um, if there are, you know, that's where we're at. Jim, the, uh, when, when we're, reviewing investment opportunities. I think what you're describing is graphically illustrated in that inverted triangle graphic that you do that starts out with a large universe of uh, opportunities and narrows them down to where you get to a, a manageable handful. Is Correct. That, that's the what you're 
Exactly. Okay, thanks. And the consultants help us with that. They have vast databases, and they met, they meet with these managers on a regular basis, not just when we're doing a search. They already have an opinion, and they update them. Two or three times a year, they have calls and diligence visits as well. So we, we do diligence ourselves in the end, but the consultants have already done uh, a significant amount of that. It's how we're able to narrow it down so efficiently. That's correct. And, and Callan specifically, I don't want to speak on their behalf, but they do take the various opportunities that um, whenever we meet with them, you know, we, we narrow it down. Their short list has to be approved by their investment committee uh, within Callan, who, who's, you know, comprised of different, different uh, leadership positions and, and uh, expertise within the specific asset classes that we're evaluating. So they have to take it to their investment committee to get approved before it comes to us to shortlist even further and then recommend to this board. And part of the justification for why certain board members have brought that up is it's been shown that there's diamonds in the rough out there. You get into these emerging opportunities. You find some people that you wouldn't otherwise find that all of a sudden become rising, you know, shining stars and may become a big significant manager no longer categorized where they were. But uh, we'd like to ride along with that if we get the opportunity. So just wanted to point that out. So if I can just be clear to understand, so, sounds like we're still going to have the obviously we're still going to have the criteria because that's part of, you know, part of our you know uh, our investment model or, or agreed to investment code, um, and these are largely non-economic. We're just not going to call them non-economic. So when the board votes, they don't know that they're voting on what the staff is determined to be a non-economic. I mean, it, it seems to me like the only change here is we're just not going to call them what they are, which is non-economic. Uh, uh, criteria is that is that really all so that they are not therefore I, kind of labeled representative Shemo, I, I agree with you I think it's I, really I think it's a misnomer based on the fact that the way the process that we have in place to select uh, in-state managers minority and women owned you're absolutely right we're looking at the economics first and then once we get once they pass the economics test then we get on to the to whether they're in-state minority or women owned and also what what's the we're looking to fill the void in the portfolio if one exists Sorry. yeah I just again just to add a little clarification from the report itself so number one non-economic implies that the board isn't considering or isn't taking its fiduciary duties in full and that's not the case and I think that's part of it right it's the appearance that the it's the Absolutely. optics it implies something that isn't true um, and now when you go down another layer, for example, in the man Emerging Managers Program, in the investment policy statement, the goals are identified as identifying and gaining early access to talented investment managers in their early stages to generate above benchmark returns. That's economic. The second one is to provide an evaluation platform for potential managers who have demonstrated superior risk-adjusted returns for consideration into the fund. That's economic. So right there, clearly, in the investment policy statement for emerging manager program, the two goals are economic. So calling them non-economic is doing a disservice to this board and, and to the decisions that it makes. And if you go on to um, diversity as well, um, I'm sure there's something in here, and I could go down here and find that diversity has been found to add value. And so, again, that's an economic reason. It's not just a non-economic reason. It actually plays into the economics itself. And then for the in-state, um, uh, again, economics come first, and you would go with Pennsylvania, but that's because there are economic impacts to the state of Pennsylvania that are secondary to our fiduciary duty to our, member, to our members and participants, but economic nonetheless. So I think it's a matter of just better characterizing the programs that we have to uh, make it clear that they you are in fact uh, considering your fiduciary duty above all else very well thanks and if it is specifically non-economic we'll let you know that we looked at the economics but you know because of the board's entire board's interest in you know PA based or uh, women and diverse managers we will clearly identify those in our memos and our recommendation memos to the board um, the decision-making process. Okay. Why don't we um, move? We have a, um, a motion as an order, and allow me to read the motion. 
Motion is in order to recommend that the State Employees Retirement Board direct the SERS Governance and Personnel Committee to consider taking action at a future meeting to recommend to the Board to amend the SERS Fiduciary Review Policy to remove the term non-economic in reference to describing SERS in-state managers, minority and women-owned programs, etc., which is currently found in the list of topics included in the SERS Fiduciary Review Policy. May I have a motion, please? So moved. Thank you. May I have a second, please? I'll second. All right, thank you. Okay, we have a motion and a second. Any further discussion before we're going to vote? If not, uh, Jim, could we have a roll call vote, please? Okay, let me see if I get this right this time. Chairman Becker? Yes. Senator Santo? Aye. Chairman Fillin? Aye. Yes. Representative Frankel? Yes. Uh, Treasurer Garrity? Yes. Matt Lindsay for Senator Hughes. Yes. Got it that time. Mr. Jordan? Yes. Representative Schimmel? Yes. Ms. Soderberg? Yes. Mr. Thal? If he's joined us. Okay, absent. Secretary Bag? Yes. <clears throat> Thank you. Uh, and we have one absent and ten yeas. Great, thank you. Uh, motion carried. Thank you. Jim, turn it back to you. Okay. The second item I would like to discuss, if I'd like to direct your attention to item 5B on the agenda, which deals with pure benchmarking. Yeah, just an introduction on the, no, just an introduction on that. Um, we also have, Terry's put up, made a big change in this organization since I've been here in terms of the strategic plan. Uh, development, very, very uh, robust strategic plan. And we have one component of it we're going to address today that the investment office has, uh, and it's regarding, guess what, fees and expenses. And there's, there, there is an item in there for benchmarking, and uh, Jeff's going to bring us up to speed on what our plans are. Again, this isn't something we're doing in one meeting, no motion for this. It's just letting you know it's in process, and he's moving on it. So go ahead, Jeff. <coughs> One of the initiatives of SERS strategic plans was to develop an approach to analyze the manager fees and expenses that SERS incurs on an annual basis, also known as pure benchmarking. The investment office would like to move forward with preparing a report with, which includes each of the SERS consultants comparing the manager fees and expenses that we have incurred for the last couple of years with the universe with each consultant universe of manager fees and expenses, thereby giving this committee an apples to apples comparison on how well SARS has been able to manage the fees and expenses that the fund's portfolio incurs. In addition, the report will also explain the methodology that each consultant used in the analysis. Unless there are any objections, SARS and investment office personnel would like to move forward working closely with with the consultants to prepare a report that will be pro provided at a future meeting. Please note, though, however, that due to the sensitive and confidential nature of some of the information that will be presented by the consultants, there, there, is, a, there is a very good possibility that the, that the presentation will need to take place in executive session. Um, as I was speaking with Mr. Ebright earlier in the week, well, I guess it would be yesterday because it's today's only Tuesday, um, I was explaining to Lloyd that in my estimation, working with CEM three or four years ago, this is, this is a, a much better approach. It's far more cost effective. And my thinking is that the, well, the consultants have a, have a large database on which to compare what we're incurring in terms of fees and expenses versus the, the universe of the managers and or fund opportunities. If this doesn't meet the needs of this investment committee and or board, we can always move to another, to another um, outside organization such as CEM. But my recommendation is that we, we move forward with this, unless, like I said, unless there's any objections. If anybody has any questions, I'll be happy to try to answer those questions. 
Mr. Chairman, I just have a comment. Mm -hmm. um, I think this will provide valuable information to the board, and I appreciate you proactively working through the strategic plan, Jeff. Well, thank you, Treasurer. Great. Great. Thank you. Anyone else? All right. Thank you. Thank you, Jeff. Thank you. Okay, ready to go. Uh, okay, the uh, last item on the uh, new business section of the agenda. This is going to be a motion. Uh, once again, our last motion for today. Uh, the investment committee charter. Chris Houston worked with Bill Trong on that. Is we all know the defined contribution committee uh, has been the components for the investment related uh, activity have been directed to the investment committee and hence the need to update the investment committee charter so and Jeff McCormick too obviously is in on everything we do uh, but Chris Chris also graced us um, with his expertise in this area so um, if you want to take it away good morning uh, so in board docs under item uh, 5e uh, you'll find the Investment Committee Charter Review Materials that includes a memo from Bill and myself and a red line of the Investment Committee Charter, which is a red line to the, uh, the existing charter and then a clean version of the charter. Just a, a little, little background. Back in February, this committee uh, conducted a biennial review. All the committees did a biennial review of their charters, uh, and this committee made a recommendation to the board to amend its charter. Uh, at that time, subject to the concurrence of the Board Governance and Personnel Committee. So it's really a two-step process. Um, but because of the uh, discussion that we knew we were going to be having about the Defined Contribution Committee and whether it was going to be disbanded and then divvying up the functions, we deferred having that charter presented to the Board Governance and Personnel Committee for review. And as you recall, back in June, then the Board did take action to uh, accept a recommendation from the Defined Contribution Committee to eliminate itself as, essentially as a standing committee uh, to be effective upon board approval of amendments to this committee's charter and the Finance and Member Services Committee charters to assume those respective uh, responsibilities, you know, investment related uh, here and then a member and participant service related with the uh, with the Finance and Member Services Committee and also subject to the bylaws uh, being uh, eliminated to, or be amended to eliminate the Defined Contribution Committee as a standing committee. Uh, so following that action back in June, uh, staff uh, took another look at the Investment Committee Charter and have transplanted, if you will, transferred those responsibilities which relate to anything specifically to investment, investment consultants, investment managers, uh, investment uh, uh, mix, if you will, for uh, the participants. So all of that is now under the responsibility uh, with this revised charter uh, in this committee. Um, so that's number one. Number two, one of the uh, uh, recommendations from the Funston report was that all committees effectively report out to the board on investment performance and risk. Uh, so there is language which has been added to the charter which specifically identifies that that is a responsibility of this committee to report that out to the, to the board. And then there were the same revisions which this committee had uh, uh, acted upon and approving back in February uh, are in the, the current version of the red line. So it's an all-encompassing capturing what changes were made previously, capturing the defined contribution committee responsibilities, and then capturing one of the Funston recommendations. Uh, so there's uh, there's two actions we'd be asking for. One is to take action to rescind the prior uh, action taken to amend the charter, uh, and then to recommend though to the board then to approve the amendments that are before you to the charter after receiving input from the board governance and personnel committee, and asking that that committee concur with this committee's recommendation. Uh, so then following this meeting, Finance and Member Services will be taking a similar approach to uh, reviewing their charter. And then we have the Board Governance and Personnel Committee later this afternoon uh, taking into consideration any recommendation that would be coming out of, of this committee. Uh, then all those charter revisions would then go to the board in September because there's a two-week written uh, 
advance notice requirement to the board of any revisions to charters and bylaws so that that will all then be before the board for review in September. So I'll open up to any questions anyone may have. Okay, thank you. I think good. Thank you. Okay. Um, and the motion uh, is in order. L allow me to read the uh, motion. Uh, a motion is in order for the investment committee to rescind the action taken by the committee on February 23, 2021, to recommend one to the State Employees Retirement Board that it approve amendments to the investment committee ch charter in in the form as attached to the resolution after receiving input input from the board governance and personnel committee and two to the board governance and personnel committee that it concurs with the, this committee's recommendation and so inform the State Employees Retirement Board. I have a motion, please. So moved. Yeah, we have a second. second. We have a, a, a motion and a second. Um, may we have a roll call vote, please, Jim? I'll start with you, Chairman Becker. Aye. Thank you. Senator DeSanto. Aye. Mr. Fillman. Aye. Representative Frankel. Aye. Treasurer Garrity. Yes. Matt Lindsay on behalf of Senator Hughes. Yes. Thank you. Mr. Jordan? Aye. Representative Schimmel? Aye. Ms. Soderberg? Aye. Has Mr. Fall joined us? Not yet. Okay, we got an apps. Secretary Vag? Yes. Okay, we have one absence and ten yeas. Chairman Becker? Okay, thank you. Uh, motion is uh, passed. And you'll note it's 10.45. We are right on time with our agenda. Right, great, right, great, thank you. Uh, there is uh, there's no special presentation. Uh, one more motion. Yeah. yeah. Uh, oh, we have to do both? Oh. Yeah. Okay, okay, sorry. That's, okay. That's, and that's the, you know, act. I thought the two were linked. Okay, got it. Okay, sorry. So a motion is in an order for the Investment Committee to recommend to the State Employees Retirement Board that it approve the amendments to the Investment Committee Charter as set forth in the attached after receiving input from the Board Governance and Personnel Committee and two to the Board Governance and Personnel Committee that it concurs with this committee's recommendation and so inform the State Employees Retirement Board. I have a motion, please. So moved. Thank you. I have a second. Second. Anyway, it's been, we have a, a motion and a second. Uh, Jim, may we have a roll call vote? Please? Yeah, there goes our 1045. Yeah. If everybody's going to vote the same, are we allowed to do that, or should I no, read them all? No. Read them all. Okay. okay. Very good. Just trying right. to save time. I try to keep him happy. Uh, okay, Chair Becker? Aye. Thank you. Senator DeSanto? Aye. Mr. Fillman? Aye. Representative Frankel? Aye. Treasurer Garrity? Yes. Matt Lindsay, on behalf of the Senator. Mr. Jordan? Yes. Representative Schimmel? Aye. Ms. Soderberg? Aye. Mr. Thal? Absent. And Secretary Vague? Yes. Thank you. One absent and 10 yeas. Okay, thank you. Motion passed. Okay, next we are going to uh, break for an executive session. We have a personnel update uh, for discussion. If we could um, move to executive session. Yes, at this point in the meeting, uh, the committee will be discussing a personnel matter, which makes it appropriate for executive session. Thank you. Okay, we've made the appropriate changes. Uh, you're reminded that this session is being live streamed and recorded. Thank you.
As an initial matter, um, while we were in public session, uh, the committee, in addition to discussing uh, personnel matters, also discussed agency business, which if conducted uh, in public would lead to the disclosure of information or confidentiality protected by law, and therefore that was also an appropriate uh, executive se session topic. Great. Thank you. Great. Thank you. So we're back in uh, public session, and um, really uh, we have no other business. Uh, are there any questions, concerns, comments from the board? Um, if not, our next meeting will be on September 28th. And uh, may I have a motion to adjourn, please? So move. Thank you. We are adjourned. <laughs>